Hello, everybody. Seed starting season is officially kicking off here in Ohio. Now, while I do plant a few odds and ends in January, February really feels like the official kickoff. Today, I thought I'd share with you my full seed starting setup, answer a few questions that I commonly get on this topic, and share what I am actually sowing today here in Ohio in the middle of February. Now, first off is my grow light stand. I've tried a lot of different setups through the years and I just keep coming back to this grow light rack because it's so convenient and easy to use. Some of you have asked me where I got this from and this is actually a hand-me-down. And from what I can tell on the little bit of labeling that's on here, it was originally from the grower supply company. Now that company doesn't sell direct to consumers. I believe they're wholesale only, but this looks very, very similar to a model that's being sold on Harris Seeds website. The main difference is that with my older model, this is still utilizing T12 fluorescence and the newer updated model, like the one Harris is selling, is using T8 fluorescence. They're a little bit more energy efficient. Some smart viewers of my last video pointed out that I can actually switch out these old T12 fluorescents for LEDs without changing the ballast. And that's a good thing both because the LEDs are even more energy efficient and because a lot of manufacturers are completely getting away from the T12s. So as these light bulbs burn out, that is what I'm planning on doing. Now with these fluorescent lights, I keep the lights just inches from the tops of my plants. With some of the higher powered grow lights, this isn't always the case. I have lights that I keep up to 24 inches away from the top of my plants. So you always wanna check with the manufacturer's instructions for whatever light that you're using. But part of the convenience of this light stand is the way that these lights are actually mounted. They slide along this track and I can actually unscrew these and move them up and down keeping them in the perfect position as my plants grow taller. My stand has three levels. I think Harris sells a four level version as well. And each level houses four of these sturdy permanence trays. These are approximately 22 by 11 inches. So a 50 cell plug tray fits perfectly in here. And a standard humidity dome fits perfectly on top. Now my one complaint about this layout, which I mentioned in a video a couple years back, is that these lights don't quite reach the edge of the trays. So if I've got a full 50 cell tray in here, the seedlings on the edges and the ends tend to wanna to stretch up towards this light. Folks recommended that I just use some aluminum foil or other reflective surface draped over the edge of these to help bounce this light back in at the seedlings. I tried it, it's not the prettiest solution in the world, but it works like a charm. Another nice feature is that these lights link. So I can plug one into the next and then have only one plugged into the actual wall outlet. I always use a timer for convenience sake. So I plug the last light into my automatic timer and this gets set on at 7 a.m. and off at 7 p.m. And I grow all my seedlings on this 12 on 12 off schedule. It doesn't matter what type of crop they are. And when I start a new flat, I almost always put it immediately on this light rack. Now, some of you have pointed out that certain seeds, like the onions that I sowed in last month's video, don't actually need light to germinate. And that is true. I just find it easier to put the flats immediately on this rack so that as soon as my seeds are up, the light is available to them rather than trying to worry about switching lights on and off or moving trays back and forth. And this works just fine with the exception of plants like pansies who will actually give better germination results if they are started in darkness. For those, I leave the lights off or just keep them off the rack while they germinate. I will also put something dark over top of them. So sometimes I'll just invert another black tray over the top. As soon as those seeds germinate though, they're going right here on this rack with everybody else. Also plugged into that timer I mentioned earlier, I've got this handy little clamp on fan, which I simply rotate up and down each row for 12 hours a day. I always, always recommend keeping a gentle fan on seedlings as it helps with issues like damping off and strengthens seedlings as they grow. As I start to sow more of my heat lovers like tomatoes and peppers, I'll switch this out and put a surge protector power strip down here as I'll need to plug in my heat mats. But right now for the cool season crops, I don't utilize heat mats. Now I mentioned that that 50 cell tray fits perfectly in these permanence trays, but I do use different seedling trays depending on what and when I'm sowing. 
I like these floating trays from Gurney's for early season sewing because they're virtually mess free. So if I'm doing sewing in the house and I don't wanna get potting medium everywhere, these work pretty well. I just pop in these soilless grow plugs, sow my seeds and fill the bottom tray with water. And I do use these plastic plug trays a lot. These were more hand-me-downs, but they work pretty well for sowing large batches of similar types of seedlings, plants that grow at similar rates and are similar sizes. So I might do a bunch of broccoli and cauliflower in one of these trays, but I don't like mixing crops with different growth rates in the same tray because someone always ends up crowding the little guys out or blocking the light. My beef with these is that they do not hold up well. A couple years at most typically, and you can see how these are already starting to break down and degrade. Since most of my supply is starting to look like this, I am upgrading to these Charles Dowding seed starting trays from All About the Garden. Unlike my old flimsy plastic trays, these are super sturdy, built to last 15 years or more. And I love these bigger cells for larger seedlings like broccoli or tomatoes and these smaller cells for things like lettuce or other small leafy greens, onions and herbs. These also give me more versatility in terms of the number of seedlings that I have to start in a tray so as not to be wasting space. These smaller plugs come in 15, 30, or 60 modules, but they all have the same footprint, so I can mix and match within my bottom tray. They're also way easier than my old flimsy plastic trays to fill with seed starting medium. When it comes to my seed starting medium, I try to balance availability, affordability, and performance. There are some really good pre-mixes out there, but I'm not about paying $30 for one cubic foot of seed starting medium. I'm a bit limited locally in terms of what I have available to me, but one of the best mixes I found locally is the Pro Mix Ultimate Organic Mix available from my local Menards. It's not labeled as a seed starting medium, but I found that it works just fine. And if I wanna stretch it a bit further and increase drainage, I can just add a little extra perlite or vermiculite to the mix. I also like to make my own seed starting mix. I show the basic recipe and the super deluxe variations in this video, but my favorite variation is the one I'm mixing up today, which is two parts peat or coconut core, one part perlite, one part vermiculite, two parts earthworm castings, and a mycorrhizal inoculant. Now I love the mycorrhizal inoculant. It's magical for some crops, but doesn't work with others. For instance, brassicas don't utilize it. So I will mix up different customized batches depending on what I am planting. You could, of course, also add some finished, finely sieved compost to that mix as well to really boost the nutrition. Now, I know the whole peat versus coconut core issue is hotly debated in the gardening world. For my part, I have settled on using sustainably harvested Canadian peat if I'm going that route. If I'm going the coconut core route, I opt for desalinated coconut core. This is because core can have high levels of salt, which can be fatal to plants, especially tender young seedlings. Now to start with, I look for fresh water rinsed core. But honestly, I have not used enough core to make any really good personal Personal recommendations. But interestingly, when I was doing my own research about using coconut core in seed starting mix, I came across a really informative tidbit on the Plantonics website, and they are the manufacturers of this Coco Bliss coconut core. So on their website, they said, while their Coco Core products are organic, guaranteed to be very high quality and very low salt content, they still recommend the following. When using Coco Peat as a growing medium, and that is opposed to just mixing it into your soil as a soil amendment, that's using it as a straight medium like I would be doing with seed starting. We highly recommend buffering of Coco Peat products. Coco Peat is their name for the coconut core. The buffering process involves pre-soaking the core for 12 to 20 
24 hours with a buffering solution high in calcium. This displaces the sodium and balances the naturally occurring potassium. After the soaking period, the media is washed with water. This removes the displaced sodium, leaving the calcium in the core. This buffering process prevents unwanted drawdown or lockout of calcium and magnesium and avoids sodium toxicity issues. So that is even with a product that they are guaranteeing that is low in sodium, freshwater rinsed, coconuts that are not grown near saltwater sources. So it's definitely something to be aware of. Now you could look for coconut core that is pre-buffered, but honestly searching for a core that checks all of these boxes <laughs> is getting to be exhausting for me. So I just settled on the Coco Bliss. I'm gonna try it both by doing the recommended buffering process and just trying it straight as is for my seed starting. I'm just gonna do a little test batch with both and see what happens. If I find anything really earth shattering, I will definitely let you guys know. One of the most common questions I get is what I feed my young seedlings with. And sadly, right now, I don't have a great answer. My all-time favorite, all-natural liquid seedling fertilizer was discontinued, and I'm having a heck of a time finding a replacement. The trouble tends to be that most naturally derived liquid fertilizers are fish-based and smell, quite frankly, rotten. Fine for outdoor use, not so great when you're growing seedlings inside the house. My old fertilizer was a molasses base with humic acids, and it was a 2 3 2 formulation. One of these days I'm going to figure out how to mix my own, but in the meantime I'm testing some other options. The first is Super Thrive, and I've used this one before, and it works great, but it is a fish-based fertilizer and it reeks. I typically wait to use this until I've moved my seedlings out to the greenhouse. And just as a word of warning, do not leave this bottle sitting anywhere where a curious, highly food-motivated dog might be able to reach it. My German Shepherd found one of these bottles in the greenhouse and proceeded to chew the lid off and probably drink half of the stinky liquid. Last year, I started using Fox Farms Organic Liquid Plant Food. This is their big bloom formulation. And I wanted to love this one. It's got really great ingredients like earthworm castings and bat guano, but it is not cheap. And for the amount of seedlings that I'm feeding, this one would put me right out of business. I also found that I needed to use the heavy feeding rate versus the seedling rate on this to get the results I was looking for, as the NPK ratios on this are quite low. So I was using half half a cup per gallon of water every time I fed my seedlings. So this year I've got a few more options to try out. I'm testing out some of the Dr. Earth's organic formulations. I've got the pot of gold and pure gold all-purpose plant foods, as well as the root zone starter plant food. And these are all derived from food waste. I've also got Espoma's Organic Grow, and this is an all-purpose liquid plant food. And it's derived from poultry manure and fish protein, amongst other ingredients. Now, I've not actually opened this one up yet. Huh, how did they do that? It doesn't stink, I'm really shocked. And I'm testing out Rev Organic Growth Stimulant. Now this one is not actually a fertilizer, but rather it allows plants to utilize the nutrients that are in the soil more efficiently. So I'm thinking about testing this alone and then also testing it in conjunction with a fertilizer. It all kind of depends on how much room I have available, but I'm hoping to do a video update at some point of all of these seedling fertilizer tests and if I find one that I really, really love. So stay tuned for that update. Now moving beyond the challenge of there just being so many darn options on the market, some folks may ask, do I really need to feed my seedlings? And my answer is always a resounding yes. Properly nourishing your young seedlings gives them the very best start at life and drastically increases their chance of success once transplanted out into the garden. Also keep in mind that unlike the soil in your garden, many seed starting mediums do not contain any nutrients or minerals at all and offer nothing in the way of nutrition for your young plant. But the key word here is proper, proper nourishment. Do not go overboard on the fertilizer and be careful with the nitrogen. Too much nitrogen can lead to seedlings that are lush and green and beautiful, but they're putting on all of that wonderful top growth at the expense of forming a nice, healthy, robust root system. 
So in essence, you'll get these big, tall plants that don't have the roots they need for success in the future. Or even worse, too much fertilizer or improper ratios of fertilizer can actually burn up your young seedlings. You may have noticed the very, very low MPK ratios on everything that I'm using. Some of the highest here were 411 and 232. I opt for liquid, not granular fertilizer. It's easier to apply. I simply add a little to the water each time I water my seedlings. It's more readily absorbable by immature root systems. And granular, if not properly dissolved, can lead to fertilizer burns on your plants. Now, I generally start feeding my seedlings once they've developed their first set of true leaves. My starting mixes almost always have some form of nourishment mixed in, whether that's worm castings or compost or a little something that's gonna be able to feed those seedlings. If I were to use a completely sterile planting medium, I would actually start fertilizing very shortly after my seeds had germinated. And finally, what am I actually starting today? It is February 12th, and if you've watched any of my prior videos, you may have guessed. Here in Ohio, I'm starting brassicas, so my broccoli, my cauliflower, my cabbage, kale, leafy greens like lettuce, spinach, mustard, mizuna, collards, and chard, bunching onions or scallions, celery and celeriac, petunias, and lots of herbs, including cilantro, oregano, thyme, marjoram, chives, and parsley. Now I am in Ohio in zone 6A, and my last frost date is right around the middle of May, but I find this early season sowing date works really well for me. So let me know, first, what are you sowing this time of year? And second, tell me about your seed starting setups, especially if you have a favorite seedling fertilizer. And if you found this video helpful, please consider subscribing to my channel, Growfully with Jenna. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.